You're listening to One Free Family, a new take on peaceful parenting, where you can hear ideas for helping to raise free, independent, and peaceful children. Visit OneFreeFamily.com to connect and listen. Here are your hosts, James and Taylor Davis. We're back. It's James again. And Taylor. And we're so excited to do episode two of our One Free Family podcast. Uh, Last week, we had a ton of fun sharing our background story with you, and I'm sure we'll go a little bit deeper into some of that in the future. But today, we just wanted to jump right in on a meatier topic, I think, and uh, that's the idea of consent. Consent is having, I think, something of a cultural moment right now uh, with the Me Too campaign, with a lot of people starting to think more critically about their own interactions, especially with other adults, and thinking about trying to seek consent, trying to put themselves in the shoes of others and figure out all sorts of different really important ideas, I think, like power dynamics between employers and employees and men to women and so forth. But I think consent is actually one of the great underexplored areas in the conventional yeah. parenting paradigm, right? I mean, as much consent or as much attention people give to consent in their adult adult interactions. And I think the level of mastery most people have achieved in this area. Like mm-hmm. I don't think most adults are ignoring the consent of other adults with any sort of frequent or, or, or on any sort of frequent basis. But in their day to day interactions with children, I think it becomes a lot trickier, right? Because so often, especially when we're parenting our own children, there are going to be times where consent can't be present, or at least it's more difficult to pursue right. than others, right? Like if the family is going on vacation, let's say they're, and one kid says, well, I don't want to go to Mexico. The family's probably going to Mexico in either case. Whereas if I wanted to go on vacation to Mexico with you and you said you didn't want to come, I couldn't say, well, you're coming anyway. Right. right. And so I think the simple fact that, especially when a child is very, very young, uh, consent, I don't want to have my diaper changed sort right. of behavior isn't going to really fly. I think a lot of people carry that sort of momentum of not always seeking consent into their, and I'm talking about myself here too, into their adult child relationships in other environments, be it whether they're teaching or whether they're parenting and so forth. And so I think today, what we're really hoping to try to figure out is where can we seek more consent in our lives when working with kids? And how can we address those times where consent is a lot more difficult to pursue? So uh, that's what, this is something we talk about all the time. And I'm really excited to just dive right in and start chewing on it. Yeah. And I think our plan is to kind of talk about it in two parts. Um, Three parts even. Oh, there's three parts. You do the first two and then I'll catch you. I might do the second two. We'll see. (laughs) Um, So just to give you a little rundown of our plan, um, what to expect. I was, you know, first we were thinking about talking just about um, times when consent might be, well, I guess first we're going to talk about physical consent because that's what's really having a moment in our culture. Mm. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about times when we can seek more consent with our children that we many of us don't typically think about. But right. when actually, if we just think about it and make some small changes, we can seek some more consent with our kids. So that's going to be kind of the second part. And then we're going to move into what are the gray areas, the times when, as parents, it is harder to find consent with our kids and how, you know, some examples from our life and how we've kind of tried to work through that and things that have been helpful to us and... um yeah, how we're still kind of working on that in our day-to-day life with our kids. Yeah, and and then the last part, I think, is our strategies for honoring our children's big feelings when it comes to times where we can't acknowledge their consent or or seek consent from them and what we try to do to soften those blows from time to time to help them gain understanding around why they can't always have the level of autonomy that they're going to desire. And I think, you know, that's as people who really care about peaceful parenting, I think this is uh, one of the greatest and most important topics, right? I think as we observe peaceful parents out in the wild, as we uh, (laughs) go along this journey ourselves, it's a very frequent, very frequently are we presented with opportunities to really look critically and say, well, geez, we don't have a perfect answer here, right? Yeah. And I think that's actually exciting. I, I think it's exciting to be on the edges of that in your parenting. And as we pursue better parenting, I think consent is a really key one. So let's just jump right in. We had one example, and you talked about physical consent. Uh, we had a, a, several examples in this realm where trying to find teach our children and to behave in such a way uh, where physical consent is paramount with our kids. But why don't you start with one? So, well, first I just wanted to say that I hear recently, you know, I think because consent is something that our culture is talking a lot about right now, I'm even starting to hear more parents talking about um, physical consent with their children. And Mm. I'm actually seeing it come up in, you know, Facebook parent groups that I'm a part of. And I'm seeing, you know, you maybe maybe have seen these memes going around on Facebook, you know, 
to to the tune of it's okay if my child doesn't want to hug or kiss their relative and I'm yeah. not going to require them to Auntie's do that. Auntie's here, give Auntie a kiss. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that was something that um, I don't think it's always, I don't think there's always been this growing recognition among parents that maybe we shouldn't, maybe it's not the best idea to require our kids to show physical affection to people. Mm. Um, but I think that that idea is gaining a little bit more popularity. So that's something that I'm seeing come up more and more, even in kind of mainstream parenting circles. And I think, I mean, that's good, I think, for two reasons. One of them is more of a long-term reason, of course, of like not teaching our kids that it's okay, that people can do whatever they want to them physically, right? We really sure. want our children to learn that. We don't want them to grow up and, you know, not know what to do in situations where maybe somebody's touching them in a way that they don't like. We don't want yeah. that to happen to them as children either. So I think the long-term benefits of that are huge. I think it also helps to teach them um, not to do that to other people. Exactly. I, I was going to say that exact thing. Like, we don't want them to then assume the role of the person who's like, well, some there are some people in the world who get to demand physical favors of others, right? right. And whether you're bigger or older or in a position of power in your peer group. Exactly right. And yeah. I think the the more quickly we can acquaint them the idea with and just reinforce this over and over and over again, there is no situation where your physical affection needs to be transactional, right? Where yeah. you're going to kiss grandma or we're all just going to sit here and wait for it. you know? Right. And, and make you, you feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, you want to be out it. of this room. You know how to gain the approval of everyone here. Um, and that to me is not and I, physical affection is going to mean different things to different people. What I'm hoping for, I've, I've found the most fulfilling uh, examples of physical affection are where everyone involved is totally on the same page with how it wants to be given and received. And I know some people are nervous about this because they're like, well, that's going to really upset my my mother-in-law yeah, or whoever. And I think that's that's totally fair. What I would suggest, especially if you already have this sort of habit developed, I would suggest that you help your the people in your life who, who may be in the habit of this at first, if they're a little bit put off, then find the times when your kid does offer physical mm -hmm. affection or something on their own and just point out, say, I've said some things like, wow, doesn't that feel so cool? And we've never had an issue with this in our family, right? so I don't no. want to suggest that. But I have pointed out to people like, well, doesn't it just feel so cool knowing that that kid doesn't have to do that and that they ran over and gave you a hug? And it means so much. Yeah, because yeah. that's, again... Just like with adults, it means so much when other adults reach out to us, especially ones we really care and love or care about and love when they reach out to us physically. Like that's a great way for human connection to occur, but it doesn't feel great when one of the parties involved isn't into it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's just utterly paramount. And then I think the second part of why I like this idea is just not only the long-term benefits, but just the short-term in the moment benefits of simply how it feels to a child, to any person really, but to just feel respected and have their autonomy mm. respected. Um, just in that moment, if if you don't want to be touched or touch somebody and you're being required to do so, that just feels really bad. Yeah. Um, and, and if this is something that's happened in your family, um, don't beat yourself up for it. If this is a new idea to you, it's just something new to think about and wrestle with and you know, just think about how this feels to you, I yeah, think. Yeah, and that's a general disclaimer that we'll probably put at the front of every episode. <laughs> yeah. Again, these are all things, many of these things on this list that I'm going to get to are things, uh, once again, that I did for some very long period Me of time too. Yeah. <laughs> in a in an adult-to-child relationship. So no judgment passed whatsoever. No, and learner's then, mind all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so the next example I think is actually related on some level, and that's forcing kids to say things. You know, a Saying things is another way that you use your body, right? Making the noises that come out of your mouth yeah. and voice box is a physical process. Um, communication is one of the most important things for people of all ages, you know, from young babies like our youngest son, August, who's learning how to talk right now, all the way up to grownups who in big time conversations, ones that feel really important to them, feel such a yearning to feel understood, and, right? Yeah. And so forcing our kids to say things that they're not inclined or inspired to say, I think can cause a lot of friction and internal strife for them. And so these are going to range all over the spectrum in terms of their levels of importance. But the classic ones I can think of in my mind right now are forcing kids to say sorry, forcing kids to say please and thank you, and forcing kids to say I love you or some mm -hmm. other big sort of emotional response. And I think the biggest – and and. 
I'm going to circle back around to this in a second, but I think the biggest issue I have with this, generally speaking, is that so often when you force a child to say something, you actually corrupt the meaning of that exchange in their own mind. Like, mm-hmm. let's take sorry, for instance. What sorry means, in my mind, and when I'm using sorry to its fullest potential, it means I did something, it hurt you or caused you pain or some undue suffering. I wish I didn't cause that to happen. And I sort of intend to not do that in the future. You know, I'm feeling remorseful um, based on this interaction that we've had. What sorry means for many kids is, hey, you that kid is crying. Go say sorry. Well, what does sorry mean in that exchange? It's sorry is the thing you say so you can avoid the uncomfortable situation of having this adult be mad at you, having that kid cry and I think the intentions behind it aren't negative. The intentions behind it are to create that level of interaction. I think the intentions are to help the person who's been afflicted feel whole or to feel better and feel apologized to. But I don't think that it accomplishes that, especially as kids get more savvy. And like, I've seen this because again, I've done it. Right. Uh, I've, I've, you know, said like, and now you're going to say sorry to two kids having an argument at camp or something. And then one kid will very rightfully point out, well, he doesn't mean it. Yeah. You know? And yeah. you're like, yeah, you're right. He Good doesn't. Point. <laughs> but the whole point of this is for, to get him to say sorry. So who cares if he means or not? That's not what anyone thinks. But when you force remorse on people or you force them to act remorseful, I think you just teach them to. And then if he says he doesn't mean it, well, what does that the other kid learn? He learns, well, how do I act like I mean it next time? Because I don't mean it right now. Right. I'm angry at him. He was he turned off my computer. And so I shoved him on the ground. Like, yeah, that's why I was angry. I'm not sorry. But if I have to act all sorry so my dad isn't mad, then I can learn how to do that. But in my mind, I don't want to teach them to communicate dishonestly. Right, right. And so you might be wondering, well, then what do you do if your, um, you know, if your child does hurt or upset somebody else and you want to help guide them through the process of, you know, just navigating that situation? Different people do different things. One thing that I often do is I just apologize on behalf of my child to the Mm. person that they have made feel sad or hurt or upset. And I usually my child sees me doing that. So I'll just talk right to the person who was hurt and say, I'm really sorry that happened. I can see that that made you feel, Mm. you know, sad, hurt, scared. And that usually takes care of it. And then later on, especially, you know, once my kids are old enough to have conversations, later on I will just maybe when we're, you know, just having – you know, later in the day when things are fine, I might Mm. say, Hey, remember what happened before? Um, if, if you hurt somebody in the future and you do feel badly about it, did you notice how I said, sorry, that's something that you can do on your own if you, if you have that feeling. Um, so that's typically how I handle it. Yeah. I I think I love that concept generally of, because what what we're not saying is you don't, your kids should never say the words, please, thank you, sorry, or I love you or anything, right? We're trying to equip them with the tools to see when it's appropriate when when that when those words match up with their emotions or their desired results so like for instance the saying we'll stick on the saying sorry for now if they are because oftentimes like with our kids one of them will feel really bad that they've hurt someone else yeah. and then we can sit there and coach them and say i see you're feeling really bad that he feels so upset one of the things that i do when i'm in situations like that is i just go over and apologize and i, I try to be specific i try to say yeah. i'm sorry that i pushed you down I was feeling really frustrated because I was in the middle of playing that computer game. And when you turned it off, I got so angry that I reacted in a way that I wish I had. Yeah. You know? And that can help them process that really complex set of emotions. Because one of the things, and I can't remember where I learned this, unfortunately, I think it's from Alfie Cohn, actually, from Punished by Rewards. When we force our kids to say sorry or to interact in those ways, oftentimes, instead, we distract them from actually feeling sorry right. and make them instead feel resentful toward us. Because they're in that, moment, and, yeah, yeah. in that moment, they're not inspired to go over to that kid and say sorry without any context or any reasoning. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, we're inserting ourselves and it's kind of a punishment. Go say sorry. you know. Yeah, and, they move into self-preservation mode because now they're feeling yeah, they're attacked. Like, Whoa, who are you to tell me? You know? yeah. And I think that's... Uh, that's really crucial. And again, just thinking about the goals, when do you want your kids to say certain words? Like I think teaching them, for instance, like you go over and visit uh, a relative or something and they're saying, give me water. I'm thirsty. Right. I think you can talk to them about how that feels. Right. And for everyone else and say, wow, did you notice that, you know, your aunt looked a little bit confused when you act like that? That was because you communicated with her as though she had to go get you water. She doesn't. She's in control of her body. And if you want a favor from someone, a way that you can ask that in a way that might make them feel a little bit better is to say, hey, auntie, will you please go get me a glass of water? I'm thirsty. 
Mm -hmm. in many cases, if she's by the sink or it makes sense for her to be the one uh, to do that for convenience's sake or whatever, she'll be happy to do it, right? But it doesn't need to be a a forced thing. Um, Now, for some people... They may just let a kid know, like, you know, this is required of me. It's, it's kind of a transactional thing. You add, you need something for me. You say, please, and thank you. And whatever else I would challenge people to say, you know, to wonder if they require that of any adults in their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's and a if good not, barometer. That's, yeah, a great barometer for seeking consent with things with children in general is that's at least a place to start. Yeah. You know, again, sometimes it's not feasible. We'll talk about those examples in a little while, but uh, it's at least a place to start for sure. So. I think circling back just a little bit to the physical piece of it, um, I was thinking of one example actually that happened recently that I just thought would be a good (laughs) illustration of how we've managed this in our lives at times. Um, Actually, just the other day, I heard my oldest son, Oliver, he's seven and a half, and our toddler, August, who's almost two, I heard them out in the hallway. I was in my room and the gate at the top of our stairs was closed and... um, I think August threw a toy down the stairs Mm -hmm. and he really wanted Ollie to get it for him. So he's saying, get it, get it. And Ollie is, you know, just loves August so much. Can't stand how cute he is and just, you know, Mm -hmm. just loves him and wants to help him and usually is pretty quick to help him. But I actually heard him say to August, well, August, if you give me a hug, I'll go get that for you. Yeah. And he was just trying to be sweet and silly. Oh, he was for sure. And, and I'd never heard him do that before though. And of course, like my my red flag went up. I was like, why is he doing that? We don't do that to him. What the heck, huh? What's going on? And so I took a deep breath and I just went out, you know, out into the hallway and I said, Hey, Ollie, maybe we don't want to, you know, require him to hug us yeah, if, if he wants favors. help. Right. And I, and I said to him, I said, you know, let me tell you why. And and he was open to hearing. I said, you know, I don't ever want anybody in your life, you know, a, another kid or a grown up, to, you know, be in the position to help you, but to tell you, you have to hug or kiss them or something mm-hmm. first before they help you. And he, he, you could see he got it. He was like, yeah, I would not want that. Um, and so it was kind of an easy conversation and an easy thing to work through, but um, it, it kind of did speak to the point about how it's kind of easy to forget about consent, especially the littler a person is, right? We have these cute little people who we love to snuggle and hug. And sometimes we forget that they're still autonomous beings. Um and then I also did say to Ollie, also, if you don't want to get the toy, you can just let him know that you don't feel like going downstairs of and getting course. it. That's okay, too. So Yeah, for sure. And especially, I think, again, this is where the lines of consent get blurred because when a child is so young that they're utterly dependent on the people around right. them, a lot of times, like, there isn't even a lot of modeling of seeking consent from that kid. Like, right. oh, that kid is crying right now because he wants more ice cream or something. It's like, well, we're not going to give him more ice cream versus, again, a grown up who wanted more ice cream. You'd be like, well, I'm not sure if... You know, Taylor should go back for round four on the <laughs> ice cream here, but you wouldn't. Like, Usually I stop at like round two. <laughs> you wouldn't hold it away from her. And, you know, while she, you're sobbing hysterically and I'm just like playing keep away and keeping mm-hmm. it out of your reach. right? And so I think kids see that and they know that there is something different about interacting with babies. And, right. I, you know, it's nuanced and I think they're trying to help figure it out. Uh, so speaking of nuance, I think another one that comes up very frequently in especially parenting circles where there are multiple children involved, whether it's bringing in other people's kids or between your own kids is the idea of sharing, you know? And I think sharing is such a hot button issue when it comes to consent. And it's actually a complicated one. You know, you and I have gone back and forth about the appropriate degree to which, especially when visitors are in our home, for instance, um, what, to what degree should our kids be expected to share the joint items that are in our house? Mm -hmm. Uh, So do you want to jump in at all with any sharing thoughts? Sure. I think, yeah, like, like you said, I think sharing is kind of a hot button issue and there's so many different approaches to it. I think that forcing, you know, where we've kind of landed for now, and of course, we're always open to changing our minds. um, I think forcing kids to share their belongings, especially things that actually really do belong to them. Right. They got as a Christmas parent present from- They bought for themselves with money they saved, or yeah, it was a gift or something we bought. And, you know, we decided, you know, they decided and we agreed this belongs to you. Um, I- we have come to a place of not forcing our kids to share those things. Um, You know, property rights is kind of where we've landed. Um, And that can be tricky. Like, like you're saying, James, you know, when you have other people in your home who, you know, other kids who have come over and, you know, want to play with the toys. Um, And I think different people have different levels of, uh, I don't know what the word is kind of intensity they feel about people using their things. So yeah. um, kids have totally different frequency in this regard. We've seen absolutely. kids that are very, very 
intense about the things that belong to them and then kids that are very loose with it. And I think knowing your own kids is a great place to start, but then some steps to take. So, Mm -hmm. so in the moment, the reasons we don't force people to share, well, if something belongs to you, no one should be able to come around and force you to give that thing to someone else. Right. And part of that is because that's not what sharing is. It's not actually sharing to go and Like if someone comes to me and says, give your neighbors $5, share $5 with your neighbors or else, well, you're not, I'm not sharing with them. I'm giving them my money or whatever at the point of your threat Um, versus if I'm inclined from the spirit of goodness and generosity or just not caring, that is actually what sharing means. So again, we don't want to convince our kids that sharing is something that it isn't. Right. And I've also often heard the example um, used as a parallel for kind of forcing kids to share their toys to, let's say I'm sitting reading a book and I'm like really into this book and it's just, you know, I just can't put it down <laughs> and it's so good. And you, James, come up to me and you say, well, can I well see that you need to share that with me. <laughs> You've had it for long enough. It's my turn. And I'm just right Great in the middle. Of, I mean, that's ridiculous. I would never be expected to just close the book and hand it to him. Mm. Um, so that's kind of a good parallel. You know, if a kid is really, really engaged with something that they're using, even if they've been using it for a while, I think requiring them to just stop when somebody else wants it, you just completely disregard their process and what they're doing in the moment. Yeah, and kids have a really natural radar, I think, for things that they're really interested in, too. So chances are good, like, if a kid is sitting on the ground and has two little action figures and they're, like, chatting with each other or, like, you know, fighting (laughs) or whatever, you know, a thing that kids are getting up to. They are almost certainly really, really into it. So you can expect in the flow, yeah, hundred percent. And you can expect that again if you're playing a basketball game and someone walks up when the score is ten to nine and it's a game to eleven and they say, "Hey, can we? You can you share that ball with me?" And you're like, "No, <laughs> you and I will not." <laughs> we are share. in the middle of a game. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the reading one is is a really classic example. And so I think right, it's on some level, it's, it becomes fairly straightforward. I think the idea of not forcing people to share. But what about strategies then when? you do have guests coming over and you know that your kid does have a ball that's really, really important to them. You know, these are the blocks that he's, he cares about so much and you know that he's always concerned about people breaking them, let's say. So what can he do? I mean, does he, is is that antisocial? Is your kid just going to sit there and like have his blocks and not let anyone play with them? What's the strategy? Yeah, that's, that's one that I think people find to be really tricky and it can be tricky. Something that I know some people do and, I think actually can be effective is to talk with their kids before people come over about, so, you know, so-and-so is coming over today and you know, they like to play with toys too. Is there anything that's out here in the house that you really, really feel uncomfortable with other people using? And if so, right. If so, let's just go ahead and put it away somewhere safe for the day so that you don't have to worry about it. And then let's look around and agree that if we are not actively using something out in the space right Mm -hmm. now, that our guests can use it. That's great. I think preparation is something we've talked a lot about. We talked about it on our first episode, but we talk about it in our parenting all the time. And I think it applies for kids too. If they have good expectations of what's going to happen, like we'll talk to our kids about it. We had a bunch of people over for a solstice party for the winter, right? And we said, there's tons of people coming over. Is there anything we should put away? And in the meantime, understand that likewise, if someone's going to come over and say they're using your computer and they're doing something that looks really fun, let's think about how that would feel for them. If you say, well, that's my computer, like I'm going to use it now when they're in the middle of something. When they're right right? in the middle of something. And they can kind of think and process. They have a a couple of hours to kind of mentally prepare for that. And by the time it comes, they handled it pretty admirably, I thought. And and it all comes down to preparation and expectations. Because just like as a parent, sometimes you're going to find yourself unprepared. Your kids are in the same boat. They're, they have no idea how they're going to process these big feelings. But helping them get a little bit of expectations in place can go a long way. Another thing related, well, another sharing thing is what about when you do have like limited resource, whether it's the item or the amount of time you have with an right. item? Because here's an example. Let's say, um, let's say you're at the library and there's, you know, a train table. Okay. That wasn't going to be my example, but we could go with the train table. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're not supposed to finish other people's. I'm going to go with my example, but that's a good one too. I've seen lots of sharing strife at the train table. <laughs> that's all I'm saying, man. Maybe it's just old wounds coming up. <laughs> I know <laughs> that train table. Um, But actually, I was thinking of, let's say you're at the library, and this came up more when our kids were a little bit younger, and we didn't have as much access to, you know, they weren't as familiar with using computers and playing games on computers and using them as tools. So we would go to the library, and the library had one computer with all these super fun games on it. Um, Super fun in quotes. Go ahead. (laughs) Super fun for them. (laughs) And we didn't have that at home. And so we would get there, 
And they would both really want to use that, you know, the two older kids. So that is a time where, you know, it probably, it wasn't feeling great to me to just say like, whoever gets to the computer first can use it as long as they're in the flow, right? right? So again, preparation, we would just talk about, you know, we have this much time at the library and you both want to use this thing. So what seems fair to you? And, you know, after doing this a few times, it got to the point where they could negotiate with my support, you know, well, if we're going to be there for an hour, you know, we'll probably spend some time reading books and stuff. And then we can each spend 20 minutes on the computer. And that has worked really well. I think the same goes, you know, if, if we have guests over and one of my sons is playing with his action figures and another kid wants to use them, It doesn't have to be as simple as, well, he's using it, so he's going to keep using it and we're done talking about it. It can also be like, hey, you're really having fun with those toys and Jake over here really wants to use them. Do you think you could let him know when you're done? Our friend Jake is in his 40s who really loves playing with toys. I just picked a name. (laughs) (laughs) So just kind of asking the kid, you know, can you just let him know when you're done and then he can use them? And so then the kid who really wants to use them knows that it's going to come eventually. And the other kid feels like he was, you know, the other kid was given the space to finish what he was doing. Yeah. I think that's a great idea because I I think that it's definitely okay to have conversations with kids. And one of the, we'll talk about strategies a little bit towards the end, but it's all, I think it's okay to try and persuade your kid to do things like be generous or something or to point out the benefits or to help them to put themselves in the shoes of somebody else. You know, all of those things are okay. And I try to avoid doing the thing where I'm asking a question that's really a a demand, right? Like, do do you want to share in 15 minutes when you're done? Like hint, hint, yet the answer is yes. And the kid's like, no. Well, what are you going to do then? Because if your answer is, well, I'm just going to take it from you then, then you didn't ask it a, question. Really a question. Yeah. So yeah. just try to prepare yourself for your kid not giving you the right answer in a case like that. Yep. And you, cause you might just say like, I, I could imagine this isn't the case in our family, but I can imagine a scenario where we say, like, if I say, okay, well, we're going to invite some friends over what toys would you be uncomfortable with them using? And they say, all of them, let's go hide them all in the attic. Right. I say, hmm. Let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, maybe we're not ready to have these friends over or whatever. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, just ongoing conversations, I think are totally okay, even uncomfortable ones. And I don't think uncomfortable conversations with your kids are ignoring consent. I think no. that it's okay to challenge your kids, to hope that they'll, you know, be friendlier or more welcoming sure. or generous or whatever without, you know, using your power to force them to. Uh, in order to get that done. I I also just thought of one other thing that I have found helpful in the past, and it kind of centers in on giving our kids more credit than we're used to giving them, which is, and I I think I took this idea from the RIE. I don't know if it's RIE or RIE parenting approach. I'm actually not sure. Um, We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, we will. And I don't, there's a lot of aspects of that parenting approach that um, don't fit with my philosophy, but there are some things in it that have really helped me, especially with kind of toddlers and, and really young kids. And one thing that that she talks about is sports casting, she calls it. So giving kids enough credit mm. that they can actually figure these things out with a little bit of support instead of us figuring it out for them. Like if so, they know what's going on. Right. So basically back to out. that example of, you know, my son Ezra playing with his toys and Jake wanting to use them. You know, I could almost say, instead of kind of telling them what to do, I could almost say, oh, it sounds like Jake really wants to use those toys. And it also looks like Ezra is having a lot of fun. And sometimes just then breathing for a minute, I have actually, it sounds magical, but I've actually had situations where, you know, then the kids just come up with an idea and they've got a plan and it's all good. So I think giving them a little bit of credit and staying close to keep offering support can be really helpful too. And then they learn so much from those experiences. They learn how to navigate those situations. hundred percent. I think the old saying Maybe it's an unschooling, maybe it's just a parenting saying that your voice becomes their inner voice is particularly appropriate in that moment where you narrating the situation and giving them a bird's eye view of kind of what's going on Mm -hmm. might help them to gain the skills and gain empathetic skills and learn social cues like, oh gosh, I didn't, I was so focused on these two guys that I didn't even notice that kid sitting there looking longingly and, you know, trying to reach for them or whatever. So Yeah. yeah, it's a great example. And that brings us to one more little area where I think we're trying to find more consent in our relationships with our kids every day and where we, I think, are still pretty much on the radical side of providing our kids space to do the things that they want to do. So just to give you a general overview of how our family functions on a day-to-day basis, our kids aren't forced to do 
almost anything that they don't want to do outside of like, you know, sometimes we go on vacation, everyone has to go on vacation. Sometimes we all go out to dinner or something. Or dad's away and the rest of us really need to go to the grocery store. We're just going to need to go. Yeah. So there's times obviously where we insert that, but I think many people, I I know because we've met many people are surprised to learn, for instance, that our kids aren't forced to go to school because Mm -hmm. they don't want to. Right. And even though they're at home, they're also not forced to do lessons at home. Right. Uh, they're able to pretty much pursue what they want to do when they want to do it for as long as they want to do it, except for when some greater family need has to take precedence. Right. And I think for a lot of people, I understand why that sounds scary. Yeah. You know, there's a lot scared of scared me a lot at first. <laughs> me too. And, and sometimes, you know, occasionally even today, but I'd like to outline why. And this would be, this will be a stretch consent goal. I think for a lot of people, and some yeah. people might just flatly disagree and that's totally okay too. But I think hearing why maybe will give you some clarity, at least to think that we're not parents, you should call uh, the Child Protective Services on (laughs) for allowing our kids to act this way. And so let's circle back, which I I think is a useful lens, at least to start with. Why don't we ignore seeking consent in terms of telling adults how to spend their time, right? So, you know, the example I've given in the past is we're all on a cruise ship together and someone walks up and they say, hey, we're all going to be going and playing volleyball. Can you play volleyball on a cruise? I feel like I've actually used that before. Never been on a cruise. I think you can. Me neither, but it seems like you can. So the guy comes up. So you're at a a Sandals Jamaica where I went with my family (laughs) when I was a teenager. Uh, You're at Sandals Jamaica and someone comes up and you're sitting by the pool relaxing with a book and a margarita whatever. And they say, hey, we're all playing volleyball. And Mm -hmm. you say... I'm good. You know, I'm here by the pool. I'm really happy where I am. This feels fine right now. And they say, oh, but volleyball is really fun. You're going to (laughs) really feel like you missed out if you don't come play volleyball. And you're like, yeah, you know, I'm good. I'm just fine here doing my thing. And they say, well, have you ever played volleyball before? And maybe you haven't. And you say, "Uh, no. And they say, well, how do you know you're not going to like it? And you're like, well, it's not that I know I'm not going to like it. It's just that I don't feel like it. Thanks for the offer. But very quickly, this would become a really awkward and kind of one of a kind interaction between two grownups. Like you've probably never seen two grownups interact that way. And there's good reason for that. It's really weird. It's really weird to come up to someone who very flatly states that they don't want to do something and force them to do it when it's two grownups. But when we come, when it comes to adults and kids, I think very well-meaning adults, especially coming from the summer camp industry where I was. Very well-meaning adults think, I have this thing that could be a really important, meaningful, or useful thing for this kid to try. And I'm really nervous that if they don't try it, that they'll really feel like they missed out someday. You know, mm-hmm. And I can empathize with that Huge, 100%. Yeah. Like we, again, when we were working in summer camp, you were running the ropes course. I was really present there. Try to overcome your fears. Try to get up you know, into the high ropes thing, whatever. Try to take the first step. Try to put a harness on. It's all grounded in trying to expand the worldview of kids, trying to equip them with tools that you think they might need later on in life. But the problem is, just like that guy on the cruise or at Sandals, Jamaica, when we ignore consent in that interaction, I think we actually take from the person the opportunity to pursue something of their own accord. Because real beauty, I, I love the idea of trying new things. I Me too. feel yep. extremely gratified when my kids or when my loved ones or when I try mm-hmm. new things. But we all know the difference between trying something new because you choose to and trying something new because you're kind of forced or pressured to, right? Like, does it even, because what happens so frequently, let's go back to the adult example. Um, the kid goes and tries to climb the ropes course and let's say they don't like it well now their fears were confirmed like i wish i never did this this was even worse than i thought it feels worse because they were forced to do it Mm -hmm. and they had the suspicion they wouldn't like it but let's say best case scenario happens they go up they climb it they have the time of their life they come down the zip line at the end they're getting out what does the adult say when they walk over they don't say they don't just share in the joy and kind of shut up about it very frequently they say now aren't you glad you tried that The implication being like, aren't you glad you didn't trust your own instincts and you Mm -hmm. listen to me because I'm wise and I can point you in the directions of things that you can try. I don't think a lot of good has been accomplished there, unfortunately. Again, even though it comes from this positive place of wanting to expand the kid's worldview, I think way too often what actually happens is you create a a power, you further the power imbalance. You tell a kid, not only do I know what's best for you, like you kind of need to rely on me because if you right. don't, you're not even going to find things that are important to you right, right. Um, without my guidance. Yeah. And I think you, I think we kind of run the risk of 
teaching them to turn off their own inner voice about what feels good or how they want to be spending their time, which again, I think we would all say that we want our kids to grow into people who trust their instinct and and have a strong inner voice that's guiding them. For sure. Because I would just as soon not have to follow my 25-year-old son around and tell him, hey, shouldn't you try this new thing? Shouldn't you try this new food or whatever? Because that doesn't sound like a very scalable solution to me. And I also don't expect, I expect that if I sit around helping kids, helping in quotes, learn new things or, or not even learn new things, but force them to try new things or learn things. Or that even I think coerce are them, you know, even right. kind of get say A's enough or that I'll gets take away your video to, yeah. game system yeah. or whatever. Um, I, I worry that if I do that, that when they're grownups or even say they're, they go to college, I know many of the people I know from college who, when we got there and absent those kind of like coercive or, you know, kind of forced things that they were supposed to try and do, do their homework, whatever they chose not to, they were not Mm -hmm. very accustomed to using freedom and they used the newfound freedom they had in college extremely unwisely. And I'll put myself in that group. So no one thinks (laughs) that I'm judging anyone else, but I, and I think that is a real danger. I, I think it's, you know, you can develop a relationship with your kid to where they have a great deal of difficulty, um, using freedom wisely if we force them to do things just because we think they're a good idea. Yeah. And I'm going to say a little real talk for me. You'll probably learn as you get to know us better that James is often the one who comes around to these things a little more easily than me. And it takes me longer to kind of embrace these new pretty radical ideas. And this one, you know, everything he just talked about, this is a hard one for me. And I, I still have moments where I'm like, gosh, I just really think my kid would love this thing so much. And am I doing him a disservice by kind of not basically either forcing or heavily manipulating him into trying this? Because what yeah. if he loves it? And it's one and that I have missed out, right? On right. And I, and I really do mode. worry about that. Sometimes it's one that is really hard for me. And so, but I, at the same time, I'm, I try to come back to the place of thinking about the pros and cons of both approaches. And for me, I've been pretty much, you know, I can remember that I've been pretty much sold on Mm. everything that James just said. And that I think that in the end, that's what I want more than them potentially trying this new thing. So I try to rest easy in the knowledge that I have exposed them to this option. Mm. I've told them that it's an option. Um, I've, you know, talked about what the option is. And so I think as long as my kids, you know, as long as I keep exposing them to all that the world has to offer and letting them know what's out there, because I think that is my job, you know, they don't know everything that's out there and I don't know everything either, but I know a lot more about what's out in the world for them to do and experience and see and touch and feel than they do. So I need to keep showing them those things and letting them know that, I can help them access those things and that they have my support and then I can kind of stop there and support them in the things they want to do and not kind of try to convince them or coerce them or, you know, force them to do the things that they're just not interested in. Yeah. I think that's a really important distinction because I think a lot of people hear about not forcing your kids to try new things and then they immediately picture, oh, so they're just supposed to learn everything from YouTube or like hear their, hear from their friends. Like you don't tell them about like, the aquarium or whatever. It's like, no, we actually do our best to very actively brainstorm different things we can bring into our environment, um, different things that we can offer them. And I'll also try to package things in such a way that they might experience something that's really important to us in a way that also kind of meets their interests as well. So like maybe we're going to go on a hike, which I really enjoy just for the sake of the beauty of the outdoors. But maybe if they're not totally in tune with that right away, maybe I say, why don't we bring our foam swords and make it a, an adventure? We'll be you know? characters and go exactly. on this big journey. And so right. we do both. And then I can reflect after and say, oh, I just love being outside. You know, like I love, I love that view. Could you believe when we got to the top of that mountain, whatever. Right. And we can all share parts of it that we really enjoy. And uh, I think that's really, really cool. Okay. So I imagine people can probably say, all right, well, I can take a breather if my kid doesn't want to learn to knit, even though knitting is really important to me, understanding that they may discover it someday. Um, And one of the ideas we didn't even talk about was if something is really important to you, if you just do it a lot, chances are good. Your kids are going to kind of learn the tools of their trade. But what if they don't want to learn something that's crucial that I think we probably agree? Something like reading. You know, it's really Mm -hmm. tough to survive in the modern society without learning how to read. What about math? You know, if they don't know how to do basic math or their cashier is not going to give them enough change and they're not going to realize like, what about these super, super important subjects? Like, shouldn't we just make an exception and ignore consent in those cases? Like, Mm -hmm. aren't those similar to 
well, you don't understand why you shouldn't need to brush your teeth now, but we're going to do it anyway because you'll thank me someday. What's your thoughts? Yeah, so I have some thoughts. I think that um, that is one that is a really common, if you kind of run in any, you know, homeschooling and unschooling circles and you read about unschooling and that approach to education, you'll even hear a lot of people, you know, a lot of people really struggle with that one. Well, I'm just really, really concerned. A standard objection. Yeah. yeah, I'm really concerned that my kid will not learn to read well or learn math skills that they're going to need. So that's something that we have actually, I think, you know, been, had the pleasure of seeing unfold naturally for mm. our kids because we kind we uh, we came to the idea of also not forcing this quite early. So um reading and math are things that actually I now view them as I view walking and talking for babies, right? Mm. Babies naturally learn. You know, this is of course barring any real developmental struggles that people some people do have and that's another conversation. So I just want to make it clear that we're sensitive to that. Um but you know, most babies they just learn to walk because they see everybody else walking and they're like, "Oh my gosh, that looks so much more efficient than rolling around from my back <laughs> to my belly. I'm just going to figure this out." Yeah. And you can watch them and we all we we have all experienced it. It's a beautiful thing to watch a baby learn to walk. And right. some babies learn to walk when they're 9 months old, other babies learn to walk when they're 15 months old. And for for babies that's a huge span of time, Yeah, that's right? like another 66% of their life. Exactly. <laughs> so so we've all seen that process unfold really naturally naturally with support from parents, right? We we say, come, come walk to mommy, you know, right. and, and we're there cheering them on and supporting them. But we're not saying like, okay, now you take your foot and you put it here in oh, most you're, cases. You're not balancing on that foot properly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we trust that it's going to happen. And the same goes for talking with babies. I mean, of course, I think it's important that we talk to our babies and that helps them learn to talk. But we're all just naturally, you know, talking to babies and babies are hearing the spoken word all the time. And, and they, they want just, to communicate, right? Like they're it, desperate. To nothing make, could be more meaningful to make than themselves that. understood. Right. And they try. They they use the tools available to them from a very early age, crying and laughing, basically, mm-hmm. and that gets them by for whatever twelve to twenty four months in some cases. And then eventually, they're like, ah, "I need to communicate something more specific that I'm really upset or I'm really happy." And they learn to talk. Right? And they learn to talk. And so, it's extremely complicated to learn to talk. Your tongue oh, has to I do all these things. I can only imagine. I don't remember and, when I learned. Yeah, but. <laughs> I mean, you look into it. And again, you know, this goes back to, and it's an example I've given in talks and stuff. So pardon me if you've heard me say this before, but it goes back to what John Holt pointed out in Instead of Education, where he talks about how sometimes kids or, or these these extremely important things appear to be so important that it's almost like they have to learn them before adults can intervene and try to mm, teach them, right. right? Because it's like, you know, they learn to walk, they learn to talk. And it's so fundamental to existing as a person on planet Earth that if an adult could be sitting around going like, ooh, you can't, you're not doing that quite right, that it might screw them up, right? Mm. And then, and the, so in, in our evolutionary roots, walking and talking were the two fundamental skills. No one, I, I would guess, before literacy was invented, cared about reading or math even. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I think numbers, I, I've heard the argument that numbers are a language in and of themselves. Right. That you can become fluent in numbers in the same way you become fluent in English, which is to say, if you acquaint yourself with numbers frequently enough, you'll notice the patterns that right, arise right. among them. Um, but so I think our general approach is reading and math are so obviously important to getting through this modern world, right? You can't help but walk around through the world and see words everywhere. And I don't think it hurts to plant words in your house. No, But no, if you're on a computer, not. if you are playing Minecraft, if you are trying to text or whatever, all these things that young people will probably want to do at some point, you're going to see words around. And when intrinsic motivation is present, but what, so people might argue, okay, so they see the words, they see that it's important, but without formal instruction, like I remember being, it took me two years in school and mm-hmm. I had a hard time reading. Like, won't, how will my kid ever manage without a formal instructor being there guiding them through their paces? Right. And I think that that's a, I, I understand that concern because we are so used to reading being something that is taught in first grade, right? Right. Um, so I would argue, though, that just like walking and talking, people are primed to learn to read at different times in different right. ages. So, Um, just like there's kind of a large span for babies to walk and talk. I think that if, if left to their kind of natural progression and development, some kids would learn to read when they're four years old and other kids would learn to read when they're 13 years old. And I know that sounds radical, but I actually really have talked to people who have lived that and experienced that. Um, 
And of course, I mean, I think those are both kind of the further ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, and I would think that they probably, you know, no scientific study here that I've read to back this up, but they probably group more closely around like seven, eight, nine, something like that. But I think that um, the just the incredible, obvious value of reading will lead to people being motivated to learn to read. And when you are surrounded by the written word everywhere in your life, Mm -hmm. um, when you're, you know, your parents are reading to you from the time you're a baby, you are trying to engage with material on the computer that requires you to read. And until you can do it, your parents read it for you. And you are reading along with them as they're reading it for you. Like even if, whether you are or aren't, whether you are or aren't, you're seeing those words and, and, you know, casually, um, I'm not sure if this is crucial or not, but just, you know, anecdotally, something that we have always done with our kids is just kind of casually in conversation. It just comes up like, oh, you see that letter, that letter makes this sound. And it's just like a quick part of conversation. It's not a sit down, we're going to have a lesson about all the sounds the letters make, but it's totally, um, it's welcomed by them the way that it happens. They just, they just want to know because they understand how useful this is. And so I don't, right. I really don't think it requires force or coercion. I think that it, it will happen. Yeah. And I think that's a kind of a more optimistic view of humanity, right? That human beings are capable of trying to learn the things that are obviously important in the world. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to be sort of detached from reality to not observe the importance of the written word. And I think the other thing is based on, you know, general literacy rates in cultures where the word is prominent, you see that learning to read is not a particularly uh, noteworthy phenomenon. Like, it's not like something that only a few people are capable of, but school makes 70% of them capable of it or something like that. It's actually that most people can sort of understand how words work because of that's how we evolved. And I think math works the same way, by the yeah, way. Yeah, all this and reading think, stuff goes for yeah, math, yeah. too. And when you play... the, the the biggest thing that I've observed to help kids learn math is playing games because so huge. basically every single game that I'm aware of, I'm sure there are ones that this doesn't work, maybe like social games or improv yeah, games yeah. or something. I'm sure there are ones, but most games, especially ones where competition takes place, math is present. And yeah. so whether it's, I mean, Minecraft is a phenomenal math game where you have stacks of 64 and you divide them in half by mm-hmm. clicking this button and you need eight of this. So how many stone blocks do you need to make four furnaces, whatever kids are doing those calculations because they see the same patterns come up time and time again. And I think, you know, going back to the example of not wanting to force a kid to go on the rock climbing apparatus, because I really love it uh, for fear that he won't, he'll love it less. If I force him to, I actually think math works the same way. And there actually have been studies. uh, And I think both math and reading that trying to force kids to do math before they're developmentally ready for yeah. it, not only will it create this phenomenon of, like, I'm no good at math. Oh, well, you're going to yeah. feel no good at math if you try to do mathematical concepts that your brain isn't developmentally yeah. ready to process. But it's also been linked to long-term problems with fluency in math because, like, times tables are the classic example here where people will point and say kids should learn their timetables by X age. Well, multiplication and conceptualizing what it really means to have five groups of five things, like picturing, well, here's five tomatoes. If I had five groups of these, that would be around 25. This is something that basically everyone is capable of in adulthood at the very Mm -hmm. latest, you know, probably much earlier than that. But if you get kids very early on and you and they're not conceptually ready to kind of picture this abstract of I have five of these, what would 25 look like? If you then force them to just memorize, to memorize it, them, right. then the brain will get very adept at using memorization when it comes to, you know, when it sees a math kind of thing popping up, it's like, do I remember what the answer to this is? Instead of developing a true number sense, right? Yeah, or a true problem solving sense, yeah. right? And yeah. ostensibly, the reason we teach kids math is for problem solving abilities. Well, it's very rare that you can solve a new problem with your memory. You right. Know? And so, <laughs> but your brain will access that. It will build neurological pathways and try to tap into its memory and say, do we know the answer? Seven times eight? We do. Good check Mm -hmm. we've got it but at later levels algebraic concepts and you know word problems and things that are a little bit more abstract the brain kind of shuts down and it's like i don't remember and i don't have the tools to you know kind of use the actual part of the brain that groups things by five and so now i feel stuck now i feel paralyzed and now i feel powerless and i hate math and yeah and i think that's a real fear for me when it comes to forcing kids to try new things that I think are more recreational, like soccer, and right. for things that if you – so my general point is that the more important you think something is, probably the more space you want to leave right. for that person to engage it without 
the use of force to engage it joyfully <laughs> because if consent, when yeah. force i think when force comes into play whatever the thing is just becomes less desirable and it, yeah. and it holds so much emotional baggage then sure well babe you know what happened we wound up going overboard as we do yeah we went a little deep on this one <laughs> so i think we will divide it into a two-parter uh the good news is we will record this next week and you will we'll follow up get to hear part two and part two uh, in case you forgot from our intro which is now 50 minutes ago uh we're going to talk about those those more gray area times you know when consent is a lot harder to seek or when it's not even possible how we address that how we help our kids work through the big feelings that they're having when it comes to not having their consent honored because let's be real that's really hard and uh for grown-ups i know it's really hard and for a kid i can remember being in that position too so uh we'll walk you through that we'll walk you through um, when our kids aren't honoring the consent of others and more. So we're pretty pumped. Uh, we're having fun and, and glad you're here on this journey with us. And uh, Yeah, thank you, you so time. much for taking the journey with us to find more freedom and peace in our families. And remember that each moment is a fresh opportunity to be the parent you want to be. Love you guys. See you next time. <laughs> thank you for listening to One Free Family. If you enjoy the podcast, Please show your support by becoming a patron at onefreefamily.com slash support. Your support will help make this show better. Plus, you can get access to rewards and additional episodes by joining. Again, that's onefreefamily.com slash support. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.